all feel free to ask questions as we go along. Um, please stop me. I, you know, I'm happy to, to take more time as needed. Uh, what I'm going to do today is basically I'm going to talk about a particular notion that I don't expect you've heard of before. I'm, I'll, I'll introduce it as we go along, but it's called differential privacy. Um, and I'm going to talk about some of the exciting connections that this notion of differential privacy has turned out to have in the realm of statistical validity. Again, I'm not going to assume you know what I you know sort of what I mean when I say statistical validity. I'll get to that too. The goal here is really that this should be a talk that's accessible even to people with no background at all in machine learning um, and help me with that. Really, if there are questions along the way, please, please stop me. Um, so I'll be talking here about work, not all of it mine, um, but the sort of presentation of the ideas here is based on joint work with Christopher Jung, Seth Neal, Aaron Roth, Saeed Sharifi Melbajeri, and Moshe Schenfeld. Um, Michelle was a student of mine and the rest I uh, were in Aaron Roth's group at Penn. Some of them have moved on since. So the plan, like I said, is there's sort of these two parts. I'm gonna tell you about differential privacy. I'm gonna tell you about the problem of adaptive data analysis. They're gonna feel like totally disconnected parts of the talk initially. Um, so I'm basically gonna tell you about two different concepts, two different problems, and then I'm gonna bring them together. And that's really the goal here. And if there's time at the end, I can reflect a little bit um, as I'm continue to work with Moshe on some of these problems about where this is going, where we, where we hope, hope this, this area will be um, soon. So let's dive right in. Um, we have this database model. Uh, the scripty X here is gonna be our data domain. Um, so you can think of, I, we live in a world where we have data sets of size N um, and a data set is just a collection of elements from the, the data domain. Um, so you, the elements of the data domain could be uh, individuals, medical records, for example. Um, a data set is just a collection of N such medical records. And we're going to be in a world where we want to somehow analyze a data set. And the, the formal model that we'll use when thinking about what it means to analyze a data set is that we're gonna assume that we have some mechanism, that's the green box in the, in the middle. And what a mechanism does is it has access to the data set, the database of size N, and it receives queries in a stream and it generates responses to those queries. So the query comes in and generates a response, query comes in, generates a response. And for our conversations today, um, we'll want to think about where these queries are coming from. And we'll model these queries as coming from, depending on the vocabulary you like, either an analyst or an adversary, but conveniently they both start with A. Um, so a script DA is going to be something that observes the stream of past responses and generates the new query. So the analyst generates a query, the mechanism returns a response, the analyst generates the query, the mechanism returns a response. And this, this is the interaction that we'll be looking at. And for convenience, you can think about sort of surrounding this interaction with a little dotted box and calling that the interact function. So you can think of the interaction as taking in a data set, a mechanism, and an analyst and running the interaction. Um, and so what it generates is a sequence of query, answer, query, answer, query, answer that are produced by this interaction between the mechanism and the analyst, okay? And we wanna be able to see some things about this interaction. So the origins of this notion differential privacy that I'm about to get to in a couple of minutes um, come from some work of Dinur and Isim in 2003, where they gave us a number of really valuable insights um, into thinking about privacy and not privacy um, of analysis of a data set. So one of the first things that Dinor Nisim gives us is some vocabulary for talking about what privacy definitely isn't, um, what, is, what is not private or blatantly non-private. Um, and they give us this definition that says that a mechanism is blatantly non-private if for all data sets, you can use the mechanism, you can use the output of the mechanism 
and, and these, these are stated informally. If you have questions, feel free to ask. You can use the output of the mechanism to compute some other data set or some data set S prime such that S and S prime are basically the same. So they differ in at most n over 10 coordinates, say. Um, this is a statement that you make with, with high probability. So that's, that's clearly not privacy. Um, so if, if we can use the output of a computation to reconstruct the original data set, we could say pretty confidently that that, that output wasn't privacy preserving. Um, and once you have this notion of what non-privacy means, you can start to sort of explore the boundaries um, of what, what is private or um, sort of what can and can't you do in a privacy preserving fashion. So there's some, some bad news that comes once you have this definition. Um, suppose you had access to a, a data set and you wanted to answer queries on a data set and you wanted to do it in a privacy preserving fashion. So the first piece of bad news is, first, let me define a class of queries you might be interested in. Um, suppose that the, the universe of database points are just zeros and ones. Um, a query just consists of, consists of a vector of zeros and ones of length n. And the way you answer such a question, such a vector question, is you just say, that vector indicates the entries that I'm interested in. What fraction of those are ones? Um, so that's a query. And the bad news here is that if you take a data set and you answer all such queries about that data set to within some alpha accuracy, then all of those answers taken together can be used to reconstruct the original data set. Um, so this is a bad news theorem about data privacy, it says that there's going to be some fundamental tension between privacy and accuracy. You can't answer all queries accurately because it's going to impinge on privacy. What does reconstruction look like? It's basically a mathematical programming problem. And so various versions of reconstruction uh, approaches basically look like you, you think about each answer that you get to a query as providing a constraint on what this set of consistent data sets could have been. What are the data sets that could have generated this answer? And then once you have a bunch of answers that constrains the space of data sets somehow. Um, and so that's the sort of the flavor of the, the reconstruction vocabulary. So Dinor and Nisim, they gave us this vocabulary for talking about blatant non-privacy. They gave us this bad news if you wanna answer all queries, but okay, maybe all queries was a lot to ask, but actually the bad news continues. Um, and so you can also prove a theorem that says that any mechanism that answers even n random inner product queries to with an error of some c over uh, root n is also going to be blatantly non-private. So now this starts to look like even sort of worse news. Now these are randomly chosen queries. And you can uh, even make this theorem a bit worse, um, even if only sort of about half of the, the answers are reasonably accurate. The rest of them are garbage. You can still do reconstruction. Um, you can do a version of this where you can even do reconstruction efficiently, um, so computationally efficiently. Uh, but basically there's some, some pretty bad looking news here. And that root n that you see there in, that, um, in this theorem at the bottom of this slide is a, is a root n that's gonna recur as a theme in, in our conversation today. Okay, so against this backdrop of sort of bad news about privacy and tensions with accuracy, uh, the notion of differential privacy emerged. Um, it first appeared in a paper of Dwork, McSherry, Nassim, and Smith in 2006. And differential privacy, you should think of it as sort of a robustness or stability criterion for a computation. What differential privacy says is that and it's written, if you've seen it before, it's written here a little bit differently than you're probably used to seeing it because I sort of wrapped in the interaction with the, with the script EA, that analyst or um, adversary, but bear with me if you've seen it before and it looks a little unfamiliar. Basically what it says is that this interaction between the mechanism and the analyst uh, that satisfies differential privacy if for any two neighboring data sets that differ in just one person's information, so they differ in one coordinate, and for any subset of the outcome space that you might be interested in. 
So for any sort of sub subset of the space of possible transcripts that could be generated by this interaction, the probability that we get a transcript in that subset is nearly the same under each of the neighboring databases. So if you haven't seen this notion before, let's take a little bit of time to sort of interpret it in various ways and digest it and why, why it might be interesting or useful to us. So again, this is a restriction on the behavior of this interaction. And it says that the results of this interaction should be nearly the same um, when we make a small change in the input data. And this notion of nearly the same has these two parameters. One's an epsilon, one's a delta. And what the epsilon is doing for us is it's, it's this uh, multiplicative factor. We have this e to the epsilon um, with the epsilon parameter and we have an additive delta. So intuitively what's going on here is I, when we make a you know, small change in the data set, probabilities of outcomes are constrained to not change terribly much. Um, qualitatively, the epsilon and the delta do somewhat different things. Um, one reason, one way you can think of this is that I, if you don't have the delta, if the delta is just zero, then this doesn't allow you to have a smoking gun. What do I mean? I mean, there can be no outcome that has positive probability under some input data set and zero probability under some other data set. This, that would not be allowed because you could always walk from the one data set to the other, changing one element at a time, and the probabilities of outcomes would need to change multiplicatively. Um, so you can't go from zero to non-zero, from non-zero to zero. That's not allowed if you don't have the delta. Once you have the delta, you're allowed to move between zero and non-zero, but we think of these deltas as being extraordinarily small. We say sort of cryptographically small. This delta is something that's never gonna happen um, in, you know, sort of in the history of of mankind, um, the epsilons we think of as small constants. So why do we call this a privacy notion? Um, it's sort of maybe clear to you uh, why this looks like a stability notion. It says that the computations results shouldn't change too much if you change the input. We think of this as a privacy notion because think about this guarantee from the perspective of an, of an individual who's trying to decide whether or not to provide their data to a computation. So you're gonna decide whether or not you're gonna falsify your row or provide your true data. As an individual, this is promising to you that if you were to participate, almost exactly the same things would happen as if you were to not, as if you hadn't participated. Uh, so there are yeah. things that could be, sorry, go ahead, question. I'm just trying to get my head around this definition that so if you fix uh, a data set and an, and an analyst, then what is an event? What, what is the randomness going on? So, okay, so where, where is the randomness? There, there's randomness in, in the analyst's choice of the queries, um, and there's randomness in the mechanism's responses to the queries. Um, and so this interaction has, has probability entering from those two sources. And I... What the guarantee is, is it says that for any, any two neighboring data sets um, that we need to generate you know, similar outcomes. Um, so from the perspective of an individual, this is saying I, whatever we could learn through this process, we basically would have learned it even if you had falsified your data or not shown up for the study. So, so now, an event course, is a chain of, of queries? And pardon? pardon? An event is a chain of queries and- uh... so it, uh, Yeah, so this, e, this the, the outcome space are these pairs of query responses that get generated by this interaction. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Yeah, then, you know, more questions. This is, this is the moment that we, we have to understand this if we're going forward. So now is a good time for questions. When, when you said there, there would be no difference between whether you participate and whether you you don't. Do you mean like whether you give your actual data or falsified data? Is that what you mean? Yeah, you could think of it as you could give default yeah, data, like, what, what that that, you know, all zeros, or you could, you know, pretend yeah, oh, you're oh, Bill okay. Gates or whatever. Right, but no right. matter what you right, shove right. in for your right. entry in the data set, it doesn't have much impact on the outcome. Right. Um, so that's a pretty convincing, right. okay. on some level, privacy guarantee. It says, Whatever we're learning, it's an aggregate property of the data set. It's not driven by you. It's not driven by your presence or absence. Right, right, right. And that's why we call this okay. a privacy notion. And it's actually really taken off as a privacy notion. So um, 
over the past you know, 15 or so years, uh, there's been a lot of mathematical work on showing uh, what you can achieve with differential privacy and the trade-offs that it entails with accuracy and the amount of data um, that you need in order to do these computations. Um, intuitively, this is something that feels really, really uh, compatible with doing a lot of sort of aggregate computations, and it turns out to be so. Um, there's sort of an interesting uh, study to be done trying to understand uh, when it really doesn't involve substantial overhead in terms of uh, needing more data in order to maintain accuracy guarantees and, and when it sometimes does. Um, but also we've seen this uh, notion of privacy adopted at large scale in recent years. Um, if you use an iPhone, you use differential privacy. Um, if you've used the Chrome browser in the past, you've used differential privacy. Um, the US Census has guaranteed that releases based on the 2020 census will all be subject to differential privacy. Um, so this is a notion that's being uh, more and more widely adopted as a guarantee for privacy in statistical databases. Um, so it's a, it's a notion that's taken off in part because it enjoys some really nice mathematical properties. I'll talk briefly about a few of them now, and then one of them composition I'll focus on a bit more because it's going to be crucial for us today. Uh, so the the first one I want to mention gets can known I, as... Sorry, go ahead. I, can you please provide an example of something that achieves... Yes, uh, sure. Yeah. So uh, the simplest way that you might uh, go about achieving differential privacy it, and um, I'll get to this a bit more later, but I uh, is you could compute, say, a numerical statistic, that, and then you could add some noise to that statistic, for example, Gaussian noise. Um, and the parameters of the Gaussian will correspond to particular uh, uh, values of epsilon and delta here. Uh, so that would be one way to do something that's differentially private. Um, but we actually know how to do lots of things. We, we know not just how to compute a, a single statistic, but I'll talk in a moment about uh, computing multiple statistics over a data set. Um, but basically, there's been sort of this whole literature has basically converted most of what you would want to do in terms of machine learning and, and statistics into differentially private versions of these things that add noise in various places, sometimes adding noise to the results, sometimes adding noise to the process in some sense, sometimes adding noise to the goals but you sort of fuzz the process in some way, intuitively. Does that help? Okay. I think so, I hope so. Okay. <laughs> All right, so, so, so what are some of the properties that this stability, this robustness notion enjoys? So the first one that I wanna to point to is group privacy. Um, what does it mean? Well, as I stated it, uh, differential privacy sounded like it was a guarantee for an individual. I said two neighboring databases that differ in one person's information um, can't induce very different uh, outcomes. But what if a few people uh, changed their data or falsified their data in the data set? Would that have a substantial effect? Well, differential privacy sort of chains together nicely, as I was alluding to before. Um, so you, if you have something that's different, differentially private, it immediately inherits a guarantee, um, a, a weaker guarantee, but a guarantee that holds when, say, K people change their data in the data set. You can just sort of chain together these guarantees, and you see that K showing up um, next to your epsilons and deltas. Um, the, the next thing that I want to mention briefly and formally is a post-processing property of differential privacy. What this means intuitively is that if you do something that enjoys a guarantee of differential privacy, then subsequent computations on the result can't degrade the privacy guarantee unless they were to somehow go back to the original data set or actually have access to the randomness that you've used um, in that computation. But other than that, subsequent computations can only make privacy better. They can't make it worse. Um, and this is either something that's sort of crystal clear and obvious to you from, from how you look at it or sort of mind blowing and beautiful, um, but it's a really convenient property to be able to say the differential privacy is something that once you do a computation that enjoys this guarantee, you can go home and sleep well at night. Um, subsequent computations are going to degrade the guarantee in some surprising way. Um, and this is, this is really valuable from the privacy perspective. And then the third thing um, is composition. Uh, I'll tell you intuitively what I mean by composition and then we'll talk, talk through some versions of comp uh, composition theorems because we're gonna use those today. Composition intuitively says, 
if I do one computation that's differentially private, so it's stable in this particular sense, and I do another computation that's private, so it's also stable in the sense that I can reason about the overall stability of that com combination of computations. Um, why is this nice? One reason is very practical. Uh, it means that if I want to build up a sophisticated differential pri differentially private algorithm, that one way that I can do it is by using small differentially private primitives, sort of as Lego bricks, to construct a more complex algorithm. Um, and the way that I reason about the privacy properties of that more complex construction is simply intuitively by adding up the privacy harms of the individual components of the algorithm. And that's incredibly convenient, as you might imagine. So intuitively, uh, what composition says is exactly this. The epsilons and the deltas add up. Um, but it turns out you can show even a more sophisticated version of the composition theorems, um, where the epsilons and the deltas do something better than adding up. So in particular, um, if you run a sequence of k differentially private mechanisms, you can actually show that you don't get a multiplier of k in front of your epsilon, you get a square root of k. And so that, that's one thing that's already really nice about this composition theorem. The second thing that's uh, nice about this composition theorem is that it's for adaptive composition. So it's not just if I run a, a, a computation that's differentially private and I run some other predetermined computation that's differentially private, but actually if I run a, a computation that's differentially private, look at the results, use those results to help me select the next computation, and then run that subsequent differentially private computation, I can still reason about the overall differential privacy of this combination. Um, and so intuitively, um, where did that square root of k come in um, in sort of the, in the build, building up the, of the privacy? Intuitively, the reason we're getting this sort of sublinear harm here is that the expected privacy loss is sort of much better than the worst case. And you can do sort of a martingale analysis uh, to get concentration. Okay, questions about this. I realize this is kind of fast through concepts and uh, ideas that are unfamiliar, but um, I want everybody to at least get the sort of spirit of the stability notion and the guarantee that it enjoys so that we can go forward and use it. Questions? So, so you said that like the, the trade-off of, of privacy is what you call uh, accuracy, right? And I think there was no like uh, rigorous definition of this, right? Yeah, a, a definition of accuracy is coming, I promise. Um, and you were right to, you, you were right to demand it um, because a privacy statement on its own doesn't mean anything. Um, I can make you a very nice, you know, perfectly differentiated private algorithm, burn the data set, um, and, and output garbage. It's, it's right. extremely, it enjoys extremely good privacy, but it doesn't enjoy any accuracy guarantee. It's only the trade-off between privacy and accuracy that's interesting. So you're absolutely right to insist. We ought to come up with a notion of accuracy and we ought to examine trade-offs. And that's exactly where we're going. Um, but sort of before we get to formally talking about accuracy, I just want to briefly mention um, some things that we know about differential privacy. Um, so the, for the rest of the talk today, I'm going to focus on uh, systems that answer a particular class of queries um, that we call linear queries. What do I mean by a linear query? I just mean a query that's well-defined on an individual data element and returns a value between 0 and 1 on a data element. And when you want to evaluate it in a data set, a collection of n such elements, what you do is you just return its average value across the, the elements that appear in the set. Okay, so this is a very simple, but also very powerful in general class of queries. Um, you can use it as sort of the, the basis for doing sort of a, your favorite machine learning. Um, if you have favorite machine learning that you like to do. Um, if you have some toe dipped in the water in machine learning, think statistical queries when you see linear queries. Um, but this is the class of queries that we're gonna focus on today. The things that I'll say are actually somewhat more general than this but I think this is enough. So what do we know about linear queries and differential privacy? So one thing you can do if you wanna answer linear queries 
with a differential privacy guarantee is you can compute the correct answer on your data set, and then you can add some Gaussian noise. It turns out you can do something slightly more clever than that. Um, and if you do something slightly more clever, the, the types of guarantees that you get look like this. And I don't need you to parse every bit of this theorem statement. What I want you to notice is the relationship between n, the size of the database, and this size of the capital Q, which is the set of queries um, that you might uh, want to answer on this data set. And what we notice here is that we're answering quadratically many queries in the size of the data set. So I have a bunch of parameters running around here. I'm asking you to sort of ignore some of them in order to isolate this relationship um, between the number of queries we can handle and the size of the data set. And so it's fixing, for example, the other parameters, so fixing the error that we're willing to tolerate and the privacy that we want to guarantee, the number of queries that we can handle grows quadratically in the size of the data set. And that should be sort of reminiscent of this negative statement back from the beginning where there's that square root of n hiding um, and the bad news about reconstruction. Um, and this is essentially, this is the, the best that you can do um, as long as the data universe is large. If the universe of possible data points is actually small, then that sort of induces queries to have some implicit relationships between each other that you can take advantage of. But in a sort of large data universe world, this is what you can do um, if you want to guarantee differential privacy and there's sort of no additional assumptions going on here. Okay. So now, after that whirlwind tour, I'm going to set differential privacy aside. I'm going to introduce you to another problem. So if I lost you, come back. We have a new problem today. Uh, the new problem is data-driven science, or if you prefer, machine learning. So I'm going to return to this picture that I drew at the beginning of we have a database, we want to answer questions on it, and I want to imagine that I'm a scientist. I'm trying to understand the world. I'm trying to understand whether or not this gene is a driver of this disease. I'm, I'm trying to understand something. I don't have access to the underlying distribution. I have access to a data sample. So I have access to 1,000 patients or 100,000 patients or five patients, depending on what kind of data I do my science on. Those patients, I assume, are drawn from some underlying distribution. Um, but I do, don't get to do science on the distribution. I get to do science on the sample. And the hope is that despite the fact that I'm doing science on a sample, that the results that I get should have relevance for the underlying distribution. That's, that's what science is in some sense all about. I mean, I'm being a bit uh, uh, simplistic here, but that's what machine learning is about. And that's what a lot of data dri driven science is about. I have access to a sample. I'm gonna find things in the sample and I'm gonna hopefully convince myself and others that what I find in the sample has consequences outside of my, you know, outside of my study. And I'm, I'm gonna be again in this setting where I'm, my sort of sequence of queries, the sequence of hypotheses that I develop and test on my data set, for example, is gonna be adaptively chosen. So I, I do some science on my data set, I look at the results, and then I pick the next thing that I wanna check on my data set. And then I look at the results, and I pick the next thing that I wanna check on my data set. So I'm gonna have this sort of repeated interaction here. And so now, finally, I'm going to give you that, that definition of accuracy that you were looking for before. We'll say that a mechanism, which is the thing that answers the queries, enjoys a guarantee of alpha beta sample accuracy if for every script EA that generates the queries and for every underlying distribution that with high probability, now what's the high probability taken over? It's taken over the draw of the, of the data sample from the underlying distribution and over the randomness involved in both my, my mechanism and I, the, the A that's generating the queries, with high probability, so with probability except beta, my answers that my M generates to all of the queries are gonna be close to their answers on the sample. This is sample accuracy. So I have a data sample and almost all the time, I'm gonna give answers 
that are almost right for the sample. That's a, you know, gen generally something that we, we do when we have access to a sample is we try to good, do good science on the sample at least. But what we really dream of is distribution accuracy. What we really want is to be able to say that with high probability, the answers we give are close to their true answers on the underlying distribution. That's the dream. But we only have access to the sample. We don't have access to the, to the distribution. So what's the problem? So for, for a minute, set aside the adaptivity aspect of this and assume that actually any queries that we're gonna issue on our data set are just fixed in advance. Okay, so then how would you do science on a sample? Well, let's start with answering one question on a sample and try to understand why it has some relevance to the underlying distribution. Well, that's just a Chernoff bound, right? Uh, if I have access to a sample, then I know that if I issue a query on the sample, one of these linear queries, that with high probability, the answer that it gives is gonna be very close to its answer on the underlying distribution. Just a simple chart of them. The thing that I wanna point you to here is, well, what, what it, what it, where does that end show up here and how does it relate to the error? So you see that, that end, it shows up in a square root. Um, this failure probability is this delta and it's showing up there in a log. What if I wanna answer more than one query? So I wanna answer say K queries on the data set. Again, set aside this question of adaptivity. What would you do? You just do a union bound, right? You have a union bound over these Chernoff bounds. And what would happen is that K would show up somewhere, but conveniently it would show up inside the log, right? So if I were to issue K queries here, what this says is what's the relationship between the K and the N? How many queries can I handle for a fixed level of accuracy and a fixed failure probability? What's that relationship there between the K and the N? Exponentially many. Exponentially, yeah, it was so obvious you didn't want to say, but it's, it's, it's obvious, but it's amazing, it's beautiful. It says that if you have a sample you can answer exponentially many queries on the sample and have them all be good for the underlying distribution. It's spectacular, right? Okay, and that was our goal, you know, problem solved. We're happy, right? We can do science on a sample except, except for adaptivity, right? And adaptivity can lead us terribly astray. So I'm going to sort of give you increasingly complicated uh, examples to sort of convince you that, that adaptivity is a real problem. So first, if the query that gets asked can be a function of your data sample, then we're in serious trouble because I can pick a query that is built to be very different on the sample than on the underlying distribution. For example, I can pick the query that every time it gets a data point that's in your sample says one, and every time it gets a data point that's not in your sample, it says zero. Uh, what does that query do on your data sample? Well, it returns the answer of one. What does it do on the underlying distribution? Assuming I have sort of a, a rich enough space of, of data points, it basically says something pretty close to zero. So if I can pick the query to be sort of, you know, adversarially chosen, obviously, I can pick a query where the science on the sample thing doesn't work out for me. Okay, but who's going around picking their query, you know, adversarially on the, on the data set? Much more natural would be to say, what if whoever's picking the query doesn't know what my data set looks like? They don't actually know what sample I got. They just know the answers that I've given to previous queries. Maybe then I'm okay, right? That's much more limited access, it seems. Except no, because my first query can encode my data sample, and then my second query can be the query from the last slide, right? And then again, I failed to do science on the sample. Okay, but again, this felt like a contrived example. Who's going around encoding their data sample um, in the answer to their query? It turns out most machine learning people are, but okay, um, let's, let's see that a bit more naturally. Um, 
What about more natural analyses here? So I'm gonna give you a, an example that I think is nice. It doesn't quite fit into the model that I'm using for the rest of the talk. It can be shoehorned in though. I just won't do the work to do it. So assume that my data domain um, are labeled examples. So what do we mean by that? They're points, zero, zero, one to the D, each of which comes with an additional zero or one, which, is, which I'll call its label, okay? And the goal is classification. The goal is I give you one of these points in zero, one to the D, and you have to guess whether or not its label is a zero or a one, okay? And one natural way to approach this problem, if you have access to a sample of labeled data sets and you wanna figure out how to label future data points, sorry, a, a sample of labeled data points, is you can try to figure out which of the columns, you know, which of these D columns is actually correlated with the label in your sample. So, so say, let's go ahead and do this. So for I is from one to D, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna compute this sort of correlation between each of the, the entries and the label. And then I'm gonna say the, the entries that were sort of substantially better than 50-50 correlated, I'm gonna call them predictive, they're pretty good. And now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna aggregate them to help me predict, I'm gonna to, to do this classification problem. And what I'll do is I'll just take a majority vote over all the predictive features. That sounds like kind of a reasonable thing to do. It's actually sort of a basically, you know, a, a basic machine learning approach um, that does get used. So what's wrong with that? Well, what's wrong is what happens when we start to compute our performance uh, of this algorithm that we've developed? Well, first let's compute our performance on the sample. And then let's compute our performance on the underlying distribution. And it turns out actually, if you have say uniform data and labels, um, that there exists a constant C such that I, as soon as you make your D, the number of columns big enough, you can be arbitrarily misled by your performance on the sample. You're gonna find things that look like they correlate really well because they correlate really well in the sample, but it's not gonna be borne out on the underlying distribution. And this already starts to give us some hint as to how adaptivity gets us into trouble in the land of science. Because if you look hard enough for something interesting in your small sample, you're gonna find it. But maybe it's not gonna be borne out in the underlying distribution. And this is sort of this phenomenon that adaptivity allows us to search very rapidly in some sense through the space of possible interesting findings and allows us to sort of mislead ourselves. You know, before we thought, before we, you know, we got to adaptivity, we thought, hey, we can handle exponentially many queries on a sam sample and we can do science on the sample. Now we say, oh no, oh no, adaptivity can lead us arbitrarily astray. What are we supposed to do? So this is a real problem. Um, if you hang out with people who do, you know, data-driven science, you've probably heard. Um, there is a so-called statistical crisis in science. Um, it's been appearing in many forms. It's been uh, appearing in the form of sort of non-reproducibility of major landmark studies in many uh, disciplines. Um, and one of one, not the only, but one of the components uh, that seems to be at fault here is data dependent analysis, which is exactly this adaptivity phenomenon. So adaptivity is a real problem. It's not just a cool mathematical problem. It's a real problem in data driven science. And so we'd like to understand how can we do science on a sample and not get misled. So one solution is easy. Don't reuse your data. Every time you wanna run a computation, if that computation was adaptively chosen, get some new data. Because then the computation wasn't adaptively chosen as a function of the present data, you're not gonna mislead yourself. Great, problem solve, except now your data by size has to grow linearly with the number of queries you wanna answer. Hold on, hold on, hold on. I was promised exponentially many queries. This is a disaster. Um, so, okay, that's not a very satisfying solution. Another thing I should mention in passing um, is that if you're in a situation where the output of your mechanism is compressible um, to a small number of bits, then a deterministic analyst actually only has the possibility of ever exploring some limited number of queries. 
Um, so actually sort of her hands are tied in some sense and you can leverage that. But what if you're not in that situation? And what if you really, really don't wanna throw away your data set every single time you use it? Can you reuse a sample and not mislead yourself? That's our problem. Okay, so we have differential privacy. We have the crisis of adaptive data analysis. And now I wanna bring the two of them together. Questions before I go forward. Okay. So we recall the differential privacy is the stability notion. Again, if it sort of is the first time you're seeing this, just think of it as you make a small change in the underlying data set that has limited impact on the distribution over outcomes and limited in some particular form that has some nice properties. So the, the theorem that's our goal, our sort of endpoint for today is this theorem um, the first version of this connection appears in work of Dwork, Feldman, Hart, Vitassi, Rheingold, and Roth in 2015. Uh, that result was subsequently improved by Basili, Nissen, Smith, Steinke, Stemmer, and Ullman in 2016. Um, those results evolved, sort of co-evolved with some negative statements of Hart and Ullman and Steinke and Ullman. Um, but the presentation that I'm uh, following today and the precise version of this connection um, is from this work of Jung Liggett and Yale Roth, Sharif and Miller and Schenfeld um, from last year. And the theorem statement is this. It says, if you have a mechanism, it's epsilon delta differentially private. I'm gonna use DP for differentially private. And your mechanism is also alpha beta sample accurate. Again, meaning with high probability, the answers it gives are not too far off from the answers on the sample for linear queries, then magically, that mechanism gives you a guarantee of distribution accuracy. So what is, let me parse this guarantee and let's think a little bit about what this means. So what does this guarantee says? It says with high probability, where again, the randomness is coming from the sampling of the data set and from the randomness of the M and the A. So the answering and the asking of the questions. It says worst case over all of the queries that we that get issued and answered, the answer that we give and the, and the answer to that query on the underlying distribution from which the data set is sampled, they differ by sort of not more than what? Okay, let's parse where all these letters came from. So the alpha is, the, so is, a, is a term from the accuracy. It's the sort of error term. The epsilon was this privacy multiplicative factor term. Um, think of an e to the epsilon minus one is basically an epsilon for small epsilon. So that's got an alpha, it's got an epsilon, and it's got a C and a D, hold those for a second. What's the failure? The failure to be close is this thing on the right-hand side of the, the equation. Well, that's a beta over C plus a delta over D. So the beta is the failure from the accuracy statement and the delta is the failure in some sense from the, the differential privacy statement. This is the additive difference um, in probabilities of outcomes. And the C and this D are gonna be tools that allow you to trade back and forth um, between the sort of the failure and the uh, quality of the, of the accuracy. So what does this mean? It means that if you do science on a sample, but you do it differentially privately, that you can guarantee distribution accuracy. And let me already sort of preview what the implication of this is gonna be. So I remind you that we know how to answer quadratically many linear queries accurately with differential privacy. And basically what's gonna happen is we're gonna inherit exactly that. We're gonna be able to answer quadratically many queries while getting a guarantee of distribution accuracy. And so on the one hand, that's super disappointing. You know, before accuracy came into the room, we were getting exponentially many queries um, and then I gave you the bad news, you know, you could throw away your data and you could get linearly many queries. And now I'm just saying quadratically many. Um, but it turns out this is in some sense tight. 
Okay, so how are we gonna get there? So first, a sort of different story. What's, what's the usual path to arguing that science on a sample gives you some results for the underlying distribution? The usual path does this. So we have three quantities that we usually try to relate to each other. So the goal is that the query um, on the underlying distribution, uh, what we actually have access to is the bottom right, the value of the query on the sample. And the, the tool that we have in some sense is the answer that we give, which is in some sense a choice between how accurate we make it on the sample and how much noise that we add to it in order to obscure details of the sample to prevent the A from picking future queries that leverage things about the sample. And so the usual type of an argument that says that the answers we give are not too far off from the true values on the underlying distribution is usually sort of a triangle inequality argument. We try to, to guarantee both that we're in a setting where there's generalization. So answering uh, I queries on the, on the sample you know, is you know, reasonably good for the underlying distribution. And we try to get sample accuracy. And there's some sort of game that we play sort of with the edges of this triangle in order to sort of reason about what happens when you do science in a sample. And the argument that I wanna to make today is a relative of this argument, but it's a slightly different triangle. The intuition here though, Sorry, did I hear a question? The, the intuition that I wanna give uh, here is that somehow you need to control how much gets revealed about your data sample um, because every time that your answers reveal something about the data sample, those properties of the data sample could be leveraged by future queries in order to try to, you know, aim at queries that differ between the sample and the underlying distribution. And so a useful tool for us is going to be to think about the sort of transcript of observations that's induced by an interaction between the mechanism and the adversary or the um, whoever's generating the queries. Um, so that transcripts of observations is just query, answer, query, answer, query, answer, query, answer. And now we're going to think about what does that transcript tell us? And we're gonna think about it in the following sense. Imagine a, you know, an alien who actually knew the underlying distribution and started with that as their prior. So they actually understood the, the underlying data distribution. And then they viewed the transcript and they used the information contained in these query, answer, query, answer, query, answer pairs to update their beliefs on where, you know, what distribution is generating this, uh, these answers or what data is generating these answers. So we're gonna write Q sub pi for this posterior belief on data sets conditional on having seen the transcript pi. This is a weird object. I will grant you that, uh, but it's gonna end up being a useful object for us to reason about. And so basically intuitively what we're gonna do is we're gonna to want to show that there's not too much encoded in this transcript that's gonna get us into trouble. And so we'll say that, that an interaction, we'll call it posterior insensitive, um, if it causes queries to be generated, such that those queries evaluated on the true underlying distribution are not too, too different than those queries evaluated on the posterior. So that's the distribution updated with the information that's been contained in the query answer pairs. Okay, a little, little uncomfortable, I imagine. Questions? Okay. And then we'll introduce a similar notion of posterior accuracy, which exactly does what you would expect it to do. It says, I, that the answers that the mechanism gives ought to be close to the value of the queries given 
again, when evaluated on this posterior distribution, where this posterior distribution, again, is you take the original distribution, you update it based on the information that's been contained in the transcript that's been revealed by this interaction. And now what we do is we take that original triangle, which is sort of a way of reasoning about you know, science on a sample and whether it has consequences for the underlying distribution, and we replace sort of a piece of this triangle with something else. Instead of talking about uh, what M knows as being the sort of Q on the sample, we're going to replace that corner of the triangle with actually Q on the posterior distribution. And now the two edges that I've crossed out become posterior and sensitivity, this closeness between Q on the, on the posterior and Q on the underlying distribution, and posterior accuracy, this closeness between Q on the posterior and the answers that we give, okay? And so that is going to be how we structure the argument. What we do is we argue that if you have a mechanism that's posterior insensitive and posterior accurate, then it's immediately distribution accurate and that we know how to get posterior insensitivity and how to get posterior accuracy. In fact, sample accuracy gives us posterior accuracy and differential privacy gives us posterior insensitivity. So clearly I don't have time to do these proofs in full, but let me try to give you a flavor of how each of these works and how it comes together. So the first piece of this is the argument. Can I just example. clarify this? Uh, Q, so this Q pi is something, uh, isn't there a choice there? I mean, these definitions, don't they depend on the Q pi? Or? So, so Q pi is the, is, the, is the posterior distribution that's induced um, by the transcript pi. So which definitions they, they, are you asking? Sorry. What, what is transcript pi again? A transcript, a transcript is just a sequence of query answer pairs. So, so that's the outcome of the interaction between the mechanism and the thing that's asking the questions. So you can think of it as I answer questions, you ask questions, you ask, I answer, you ask, I answer, you ask, I answer. And then that's the output. Question, answer, question, answer, question, answer, question, answer. An observer who only saw the questions and the answers could I infer from that something about the database uh, that I'm using to answer these questions? So this distribution is basically part of the mechanism, right? So somehow the mechanism comes with- So, the, so the, 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 the mechanism is allowed to basically take the question in a data set and do whatever they want to. But yeah, the mechanism is essentially, it defines, you know, an induced distribution on answers given, you know, questions and data sets. Um, and so when I see this transcript, I can back out from that something about the data set that induced it. Okay, so then the question is how you generate it, right? That's, that's the challenge. I mean, how, how do you define this distribution? Yeah, so how do you, how you define which distribution? And how do you come up with something? How do you come up with the M? Yeah, so like how can you come up with an M that in some sense is not encoding too much information about the sample um, because that's problematic um, because it allows future queries to leverage it, but it encodes enough information about the sample that it's not just returning garbage. You know, it's easy to answer queries in a way that doesn't encode anything about the sample, but it's not interesting. The interesting thing is somehow to answer queries in a way that says something about the way that the sample reflects the underlying distribution, but you don't know the underlying distribution, you just have the sample, um, and somehow prevents somebody who's watching from learning too much about the particulars of the sample. And that's exactly the tension that's supposed to be encoded here, in some sense, in this transcript. Because the transcript is, is basically, the transcript is what we've learned about the sample so far. And the question is, how can we sort of trade off between having learned enough that it's actually meaningful, but not so much that we get ourselves in trouble um, by a sort of overfitting to the sample. So that's the trade off that we face here. And what this theorem says is that we actually can balance this trade off in some sense, if we can achieve sample accuracy and differential privacy simultaneously.
because sample accuracy is going to give us this posterior accuracy guarantee, and you haven't seen this yet, but it's going to give us this bottom edge of the triangle. It's going to cause our answers to be close to the values of the queries that get issued on this posterior. And differential privacy is going to give us this posterior insensitivity guarantee. So it's going to give us this right-hand side of the triangle, which is going to say that actually the queries that get asked are going to give similar answers on the underlying distribution as on the posterior that they induce. Um, and given time, I'm going to just sort of very briefly give you a hint at what, what goes into this. So a key idea in reasoning about this is this Bayesian resampling lemma. And what the Bayesian resampling lemma says is that there are two worlds that are identical. One of them is sample a data set and have it induce a transcript. That what that induces is some distribution over samples and transcripts. Another thing you could do is sample a data set, induce a transcript, look at the posterior distribution over data sets that are induced by that transcript, and then resample a data set from that posterior. It turns out that the distribution over pairs of data sets and transcripts is the same if you resample from the posterior as if you'd just done the original sampling and then inducing of the transcript. And once you have this sort of equivalence of resampling from the posterior distribution, that ends up being a really nice tool for us. And you can think intuitively the argument for why uh, sample accuracy gives you posterior accuracy. Um, what this is saying in some sense is, okay, if you didn't have posterior ac accuracy, what would that mean? It would mean that you've managed uh, to uh, answer queries in some way uh, where the, the answers on the induced distribution are very far from the, the uh, sort of the, sorry, the, the answers that you give are very far from the answers on the induced distribution. Um, but what are the answers on the induced distribution? You can think of that equivalently as the answers on the sample that generated uh, the induced distribution. Um, and so you can sort of immediately draw a connection to sample accuracy. There's a extra twist in there that I'm skipping over for time. Um, why is differential privacy capturing something that's useful for us? Well, okay, so imagine you were in a situation where you didn't achieve posterior insensitivity. So what does that mean? Let's go back to our picture. Um, it means that somehow you've come up with a bad transcript. And it's a bad transcript that contains queries that when evaluated in the underlying distribution give totally different answers than the queries on the distribution that they induce in some sense, the posterior distribution that they induce. And what that's saying in some sense is that what's happened here is you've managed to pick uh, transcripts where the uh, relationship between the transcript and the points in the sample is somehow very, very, they're sort of very tightly intertwined. Um, and again, since I'm out of time, I'll just give you the punchline, which is that differential privacy actually ensures um, that these uh, distributions are well behaved in a, in a certain sense. And so when you put this all together, you get this consequence, the differential privacy plus sample accuracy um, gives you this magical property that you can do science on a sample. Since I'm technically out of time, I'm gonna stop here, but if anybody wants to ask questions, I'm happy to stick around um, and thank you. All right, thank you. It was a, a refreshing topic. <laughs> Thanks guys. Any questions? So one question I have is, um, so one thing you, the basic example you gave at the beginning was that if the um, the analyst, I get, not the analyst, the one that asked the question, the scientist, yeah. I guess, or uh, so if it, if this guy uses, um, you know, 
some peaks in advance set of queries, which is even exponentially large, then there are no problems, right? We can mm -hmm. uh, absolutely guarantee. Have you considered um, trying to understand like whether natural limitations on on this object, on this uh, person, like maybe if it has short memory or if it can only remember, uh, you know, the answers to whatever many queries from the past, whether there is some kind of um, characterization of, like maybe you can exploit limitation, natural limitations of, of that. Uh, yeah, absolutely. So that's that's one one of one of the I think nice directions to go with this is that you'd hope to be able to actually to do better than quadratically many queries in situations where it's for whatever reason not worst case. The queries aren't worst case. The you know the data sample is somehow you know well behaved for these queries, and so on and so forth. You can imagine a number of ways in which you could be non worst case, and that's sort of. The, the next thing I wanted to say, which is basically differential privacy is super, super paranoid worst case in so many different dimensions. You know, it was, it was for all, for all, for all, for all. Um, what if we relax some of those for alls? Can you still say something here? Um, and the answer is yes. Um, so if you're willing to um, limit the amount of information that the adversary carries or the analyst, whoever's generating the queries, carries from round to round, um, that explicitly can give you some better results. Um, and also in more recent work, we're looking at other ways of trying to understand even on the fly um, when we've experienced queries that are actually not overfitting queries. And we can take advantage of that and say, actually, today you're lucky you can keep doing science on your sample. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that, absolutely, that's, that's the right direction to go with this, I think. Other questions? All right, if not, let's take the speaker again. And uh, if, if people want to stay in the chat. Or... Yeah, I'm happy to hang around if anybody wants to hang around. And i um, happy also if you want to follow up by email if you have questions. Um, I realize this was a fast paced uh, coverage of a bunch of different things. Um, so if you're interested to dive deeper, I'd really be happy to give pointers. All right, thank you for coming. Thanks. Thanks for having me. Appreciate the invitation. Thank you, Katrina. I, I have to go. There is a there is a lecture now that we give to graduate to new graduate students. So. Uh...